السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين أفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم انشر علينا رحمتك وانزل علينا حكمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام uh, So I want to thank all of you for being here I know most of you were here last night for a beautiful uh, really celebration of uh, Al-Isra'i wal Mi'raj um, and a way to learn and to connect to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to learn from his relationship of constant ascension and connection with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Today is also a very special session because today we're talking about the day in which Yusuf Alayhi Salam clears his name. Now we have been waiting for this for a, few, for a while now because Yusuf Alayhi Salam, he could have had opportunities in which he would have protested his imprisonment but he passed them up because what was more interested what was more important to him rather was that his name should be cleared that his reputation should be intact and that his integrity should be unquestioned and so that came before any other consideration even his own freedom so last week we talked about how yusuf alayhi salam and his prison mates interacted how they saw him just from his demeanor, from that initial interaction, inna naraka min al muhsinin, that we can easily, readily perceive that you are from the good doers. And so, this is the nature of the believers: is that when they interact with people, they always leave a positive impression, right? Even before they start preaching or before they start doing anything, you can tell the difference between a person that is motivated by their awareness that Allah is watching their every action and the person that just lives life based on what they can get away with, just expediency. And how he interpreted their dreams and he told the one that الَّذِي ظَنَّ أَنَّهُ نَاجِمْ مِنْ So there was one out of the two prison mates that he knew was going to be saved. He said, أُقُرْنِي عِنْدَ رَبِّكْ So make sure that you don't forget to mention me before your Lord, meaning the king. Because as you remember, he was the distiller for the king. And so he knew Yusuf alayhi salam wanted that when he's released and when he's back in the employment of the king, that he should mention that there is a wrongly convicted person in the prison. This is before the Innocence Project, right? So you're not going to petition or get DNA evidence. He needed to get that petition before the king. And so he found that avenue. And we talked about it last week that that, in fact, does not show any deficiency in his reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, he was laying the groundwork and facilitating the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by making things happen, right? So if you don't do things, then you shouldn't expect anything to happen. Now, as you know, that did not actually happen because he forgot, right? And who's the one that caused him to forget? Shaytan, right? But that's also not outside of Allah's plan. And people, they often uh, struggle with this. They said, well, Shaytan caused this to happen. And so they think that Allah's will is one thing and Shaytan's temptation is something different, right? Similarly, people, they're, they're, they're worried about the effect of uh, some kind of sihr, and they think that, okay, well, how am I going to have protection from this? In fact, nothing can happen in your life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not already decreed. So this was all meant to be. There is no parallel universe in which things transpire in a different way. Everything that happens, everything that reaches you is meant to reach you, and everything that misses you was never meant for you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a different plan for him to rise in power and in influence. Earlier when he found himself in the house of Al-Aziz, Allah says that وَكَذَلِكَ مَكَّنَّا لِيُوسُفْ And in fact, in Surah Yusuf, Allah mentions this وَلَقَدْ مَكَّنَّا 
this tamkeen in which Allah establishes Yusuf on the earth in the surah. Anybody know how many times? Almost two times. He mentions one every time something seemingly bad happens, but it's actually good. Then you see the ayah, وَلَقَدْ مَكَّنَّا Yusuf That we, the first tamkeen was him entering in the house of Al-Aziz. It seems like he's imprisoned. Seems like he's in a foreign land. He's away from his family. But Allah found a way for Yusuf to find a way within the society in which he could now make a difference. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after he mentions the dream, then Allah says again that there was a second tamkeen. Something is happening. There's a change in the scene. So we're going to recite, inshallah, from ayah number 43. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Wa qala al-maliku inni ara sab'a baqaratin simani ya'kuluhunna sab'un ijaf. يَأْكُلُهُنَّ سَبْعٌ عِجَافٌ وَسَبْعَ سُنْبُلَاتٍ خُضْرٍ وَأُخَرَ يَابِسَاتٍ يَا أَيُّهَا الْمَلَأُ يَا أَيُّهَا الْمَلَأُ أَفْتُونِي فِي رُؤْيَايَ أَفْتُونِي فِي رُؤْيَايَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لِلرُّؤْيَا تَعْبُرُونَ قَالُوا أَضْغَاثُ أَحْلَامٍ وَمَا نَحْنُ بِتَأْوِيلِ الْأَحْلَامِ بِعَالِمِينَ وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ جَا مِنْهُمَا وَدَّكَرَ بَعْدَ أُمَّةٍ أَنَا أُنَبِّئُكُمْ أَنَا أُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِتَأْوِيلِهِ فَأَرْسِلُونَ يُوسُفُ أَيُّهَا الصِّدِّيقُ أَفْتِنَا فِي سَبْعِ بَقَرَاتٍ سِمَانٍ في سبع بقرات سمان يأكلهن سبع عجاف وسبع سنبلات خضر وأخر يابسات لعلي أرجع إلى الناس لعلهم يعلمون قال تزرعون سبع سنين دأبا فما حصدتم فذروه في سنبله فِي سُنْبُلِهِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِمَّا تَأْكُلُونَ ثُمَّ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ سَبْعٌ شِدَادٌ يَأْكُلْنَ مَا قَدَّمْتُمْ يَأْكُلْنَ مَا قَدَّمْتُمْ لَهُنَّ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِمَّا تُحْصِنُونَ ثُمَّ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ عَامٌ فِيهِ يُغَاثُ النَّاسُ فيه يغاث الناس وفيه يعصرون. And one day the king said, I dreamt of seven fat cows eaten up by seven skinny ones and seven green ears of grain and seven others dry. O oh chiefs, tell me the meaning of my dream if you can interpret dreams. They replied, these are confused visions and we do not know the interpretation of such dreams. Finally, the surviving ex-prisoner remembered Joseph after a long time and said, I will tell you its interpretation, so send me forth to Joseph. He said, O oh Joseph, O oh man of truth, interpret for us the dream of seven fat cows eaten up by seven skinny ones and seven green ears of grain and seven others dry, so that I may return to the people and let them know. Joseph replied, you will plant grain for seven consecutive years, leaving in the ear whatever you harvest, except for the little that you will eat. Then after that will come seven years of great hardship, which will consume whatever you have saved, except the little you will store for seed. Then after that will come a dream, after that will come a year in which people will receive abundant rain and they will press, meaning press oil and wine. So this scene, it begins with the dream of the king of Egypt. The king of Egypt had a dream that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused in order to facilitate the release of Yusuf from prison. That's one reason. Another reason is that it would be the cause of the famine being avoided because they would store 
the grain in sufficient quantities to survive the very lean years in which they would not be able to harvest anything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also made it a means for him being reunited with his family. All of this happened because of this single vision. So this also reminds us how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is al-fattah. So we never really know which door is going to open and all of the problems that we're facing will dissipate simply by a very small event or a small occurrence that will have a great consequence. Now, when the king had the dream, he was astonished and he was fearful. And it means that he knew that it has a deep meaning. The fact that he kept going around asking people that I need to interpret this dream shows that he understood its importance. He gathered his mala, all the priests, the chiefs of the state, the princes. He told them what he had seen in the dream. And he said, In kuntum If you're able to interpret dreams, please tell me what it means. But they didn't know. So instead of saying, you know, this is typical, human nature, right? When we don't know something, what do we say? The problem is not with us. The problem is with you, right? So instead of saying, well, we don't know, we don't understand it, they said, no, what's wrong with your vision? This dream is all messed up. Adghatu ahlam. It's just like different visions and the unconnected cow and grain. And it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit in together. Right? وَمَا نَحْنُ بِتَأْوِيلِ الْأَحْلَامِ بِعَالِمِينَ And why are you asking us? This is not our area of expertise. Right? So this is a false dream is what they're implying. But there was a man that was the distiller that had been in prison with Yusuf السلام, and he heard this transpire. So as you know, shaitan had plotted to make him to forget that. But years later, there's a long gap that takes place, right? I think we said it's like almost seven years, according to most of the Mufassirin. And he remembers his forgetfulness. And then he says to the king and his entourage, Ana unabbi'ukum bita'wili. Look at his confidence. He said, don't worry, I'm going to tell you all about this dream. I'm going to give you the interpretation. Just fa'arsiloon. Just send me to Yusuf and he's going to. He is a man of truth. And so before... The man even goes to Yusuf, everybody knows. So this is not something that's happening behind the scenes. They know that he's going to prison. They know that Yusuf is known as a man of truth. So then they sent him and he interacts with Yusuf. He said, Yusufu ayyuha siddiq. Right? Aftina fi sab'i baqarat. And then he continues. He said, Yusuf, O oh man of truth, explain to us. And he mentions the king's dream. So as soon as he greets Yusuf, he addresses him by a title that reflects who he is. As-Siddiq. And so then Yusuf interprets it. Now, how would you feel if the person that was supposed to get you out of prison shows up and not only is he not apologetic, he's like, oh my God, I messed up your life. He doesn't say any of that. Why is he in the prison? Why is he there? Because he wants something. How many of you would be offended? Like, I am here because of you not telling them what happened to me. And in, on top of that, the cherry on top of that, you have the audacity to come down to me because you need something? How dare you? Right? So you got to put yourself in Yusuf alayhi salam shoes. He does not criticize this man for forgetting his request. And most of us, if we have a little bit of leverage, what do we do with that leverage? The guy is coming because he needs something. Yusuf needs something too. What does Yusuf need? He needs freedom. So somebody needs something before you give them what they need. What would you say? You say, no problem. I'll tell you the interpretation of the dream. I need a key first, right? Let me get out of here, and then I will, I will take care of whatever it is that you need. He could have made it a precondition of his release before explaining the meaning. But rather, he says, تَزْرَعُونَ سَبْعُ سَبْعُ سِنِينَ دَأَبًا He says that there are going to be seven 
consecutive years, one after another, that you will sow your agriculture. Says Ra'una Sabari Sinin, and you will receive the normal amount of rain, the normal amount of harvest and fertility for seven consecutive years. Now this also shows the wisdom of Yusuf alayhi salam. Where did he get the seven years of harvest? He interpreted the seven cows as meaning seven years of agriculture. Why? Because cows till the land that produce the fruits and the vegetables, which are represented by the green ears of corn, right? And that's what that's how he connected between the cows and the seven years of agriculture. Now, after he explains this, that you're going to have these seven consecutive years, he goes beyond just interpreting this, and then he recommends what they should do during these fertile years. So he's interpreting the dream. As he's interpreting the dream, there's commentary. Everybody with me? He could just say, oh, the dream means A, B, C, D. As he's interpreting the dream, he's adding his own commentary and his own recommendation. That shows the value added of having Yusuf alayhi salam, right? He said, فَمَا حَصَدْتُمْ فَذَرُوهُ فِي سُنْبُرِي إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِمَّا تَأْكُلُونَ He says that the harvest which you reach, you should leave it in its ears. Why should you leave it in the ears? Why not take the grain out? To preserve it. Because if you open it up, it's now going to be exposed to bacteria. Right? And it will have a higher likelihood of spoilage. So you should keep it within the ears. Keep all that grain there. Illa qalilam mimma ta'kulun. So just eat the minimum that's necessary. Very little that you're going to consume. So he recommends that they should try to save as much as possible. He said, whatever you harvest during those seven fertile years, leave it to preserve it better. Right? And he's also advising them away from Israf. Don't be extravagant. Actually, Qari Anas, he recited from the first three pages of Surah Al-Isra in, in, uh, in Warsh, very beautiful recitation. And one of the verses is, لا تجعل يدك مغلولة إلى عنق ولا تبسطها كل البسط That you should not be so stingy and miserly that you take your hand to your neck. But don't extend your hand so wide. Don't be so overly generous that you become reckless. Right? And then you become destitute yourself. So, right? so be balanced. Right? So he, what he's saying is don't be extravagant. Just take the little that you need. And this is represented by the seven, because after these seven years of, that are fertile, you're going to have seven years of drought. That will come right after. And this is represented by the seven lean cows that eat the seven fat cows. So during the seven years of drought, they're going to eat from, everybody with me? So the lean ones are eating the heavy ones, which means that in those seven years, you're going to eat which harvest? The harvest that was collected in the fat years, which is why you have the lean cows eating the heavy cows. Because that represents the harvest, not the animal, not the cow itself. right? And this is represented by the dry ears of corn in the dream. Now Yusuf, he tells them that during these years, those remaining ears are not going to produce anything. That no matter what they try to plant, there won't be any harvest. Which will devour what you have laid by in advance for them, all except a little of what you have guarded, what you have stored. Now then after these seven and then seven, then he delivers a good news to them. That after the consecutive years of drought, there will come a fertile year during which people will receive rain, and the land will produce in abundance again. Fihi asirun, and people will be able to press wine, people will be able to press oil as they normally do. 
Now I have a question. Why did Yusuf mention an eighth year? So we know seven and then seven. Where did he get this eighth year? Is this in the dream? Where is that in the dream? We, we, I mean, we heard the dream described. There is no eighth year in the dream. So why did Yusuf mention that? Where did he get it from? Because the dream only talked about the seven years of good crop followed by seven years of famine, right? He added that there will be one year of good rain and crops. So there's a couple possibilities. One is that Yusuf came to know about it because he knew definitively that the, the number is limited to seven. That means by implication that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after ending the famine, that the eighth year is going to be full of rain and crops. Now Qatada, one of the early Mufassireen, said that Allah had Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam know about it through an independent revelation that Allah had inspired him so that the amount of information he was able to provide them would be above and beyond what was in the dream. To indicate that he is a prophet. He needed to have additional information to show his spiritual excellence that he is in order to also be a reason for him to be released. Now, this is possible, but there's no reason for knowing that. I mean, this is, we're adding something that's not in the story, right? So I'm not totally convinced of that. I think the main factor is that Yusuf alayhi salam, he did not want to limit himself to technically interpreting the dream. He felt that as a muhsin, as a good doer, he needed to give them advice based on his experience and his wisdom. Because as he's relating the story, he's telling them with a running commentary that, oh, in these years you need to stay, put it away. In these years, then you can consume from it. And he gives them advice even on bacteria. That has nothing to do with interpreting the dream. He says, no, 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 you got to leave it inside. Make sure you cover your food, put it in the fridge. You know, it's like, okay, thanks, mom. Right? But Yusuf alayhi salam is adding all this additional information to show the guidance and wisdom that's coming from him. And eventually, Yusuf alayhi salam, he is freed. Now, if he had negotiated his freedom in the beginning, then he would have been freed because of what? Because of his skill. He would have been known, oh, he got freed because he's a talented interpreter of dreams. That would have been the reason. But would he be the minister of finance? No. They would have went on their ways and the king would have not been impressed at him the way that he was. But instead, Allah decreed that he would have vast wealth and bounty under his stewardship. All right, this takes us to ayah number 50. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. وَقَالَ الْمَلِكُ اُتُونِي بِهِ فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُ الرَّسُولُ قَالَ رُجِعْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَاسْأَلْهُ مَا بَالُ النِّسْوَةِ اللَّاتِي قَطَّعْنَ أَيْدِيَهُنْ إِنَّ رَبِّي بِكَيْدِهُنَّ عَلِيمٌ قَالَ مَا خَطُبُكُنَّ إِذْ رَاوَدْتُنَّ يُوسُفَ عَنْ نَفْسِهِ قُلْنَا حَاشَ لِلَّهِ مَا عَلِمْنَا عَلَيْهِ مِنْ سُوءٍ قَالَتِ امْرَأَةُ الْعَزِيزِ الْآنَ حَصْحَصَ الْحَقَّ أنا راودته عن نفسه وإنه لمن الصادقين ذلك ليعلم أنه لم أخنه بالغيب وأن الله لا يهدي كيد الخائنين وما أبرئ نفسي إن النفس لأمرة بالسوء إلا ما رحم ربي إن ربي غفور رحيم وقال الملك اتوني به استخلصه لنفسي فلما كلمه قال انك اليوم لدينا مكين امين قال اجعلني على خزائن الارض اني حفيظ عليم وكذلك مكنا ليوسف في الارض يتبوا منها حيث يشاء نصيب برحمتنا من نشاء ولا نضيع أجر المحسنين 
ولا أجر الآخرة خير للذين آمنوا وكانوا يتقون. The king then said, "Ituni bi, bring him to me." When the messenger came to him, Joseph said, "Go back to your master and ask him about the case of the women who cut their hands." Surely my lord has full knowledge of their cunning. The king asked the women, "What did you get when you tried to seduce Joseph?" They said, "Hashalillah, Allah forbid. We know nothing in this about him." Then the chief minister's wife admitted, "Now the truth has come to light. It was I who tried to seduce him, and he is surely truthful. From this, Joseph should have no should know that I did not speak dishonestly about him in his absence." For Allah certainly does not guide the scheming of the dishonest, and I do not seek to free myself from blame. For indeed, the soul is ever inclined to evil, except those shown mercy by my Lord. Surely, my Lord is all forgiving, most merciful. The king said, "Bring him to me. I will employ him exclusively in my service." And when Joseph spoke to him, the king said, "Today, you are highly esteemed and fully trusted by us." Makinun Amin. Joseph proposed, "Put me in charge of the storehouses of the land, for I am truly reliable and adept." This is how we establish Joseph in the land to settle wherever he pleased. We shower our mercy on whoever we will, and we never discount the reward of the good doers. And the reward of the hereafter is far better for those who are faithful and are mindful of Allah. Here, Allah describes the investigation. The king he launches a full investigation, the trial that should have happened the first time, but didn't happen. It's happening now. So now they're examining what really went down, what happened between the wife of Al Aziz, the women of the children, the women of the city, and Yusuf. But before we go uh, further, I have a I have a question, a little tangent. What are the rulers of Egypt called? We all know this. Hmm. The Pharaoh, the Pharaoh. Do you know that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions Fir'aun, the Pharaoh, in the Quran sixty-five times? Sixty-five times. Pharaoh of Musa, Fir'aun of Musa is mentioned. Some they believe him to be Ramses the second. Others they say no, it's it's before Ramses the second. But sixty-five times, and in this story, there is not a single place. In which he's mentioned as Pharaoh, as Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. Mashallah. Is before Musa, but it's just like you said, it's the new kingdom which is before Musa. Yeah, that's right. Masha Allah. So you know your Egyptology very well. So this is exactly right because the rulers from the 15th to the 17th dynasty of the old kingdom, they were foreigners. In fact, they were from uh, the. So the term started from the new kingdom, which is the 18th dynasty, which is the rule of Tutmos, which is before Ramses the first and the second. Right, but this is about fourteen thirty BC, which is before the time of Musa. Right, that's why we're doing Yusuf. We didn't get to Musa yet. So the word Pharaoh, the Pharaoh, even the word it means like great house or the elite bloodline, like a pure blood. So they would not call any person as Pharaoh. So at that time, the term that was used is Al Malik. But when we go to the Hebrew Bible and the the Old Testament, and we open the chapters of Genesis. It says Pharaoh for all of them, and this is a very strong evidence to any person that says, "Oh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he did copy and paste from the Bible." Well, this is a very professional copy and paste because he only copied all the thing that was correct and he removed all the errors. If he copied everything. Then how did he fix all the mistakes? Because in the Bible, the word Pharaoh is used for both dynasties. And how would anyone know that? How would the Prophet ﷺ know that 
without knowing hieroglyphics. Even until very, very recently, ancient Egyptian heritage was lost for centuries, for hundreds of years. Nobody was studying it, nobody was looking into it, nobody was researching. It's only recently, in the last 200 years, that people have started to dig into it after a very long period. And so, well, well who is this Malik? So there are lots of different theories, but the dominant theory is that the 15th to 17th dynasties, it was an, an invading force from Palestine, which was known as the Hyksos uh, rule. And this is a Greek word of the Egyptian title, which is the Heka Hasut, which means the rulers from the foreign land. And so because of that, they wouldn't use the title Pharaoh, they would say the king, because it was not a domestic leader, it was somebody from, from outside. Now, uh, I don't know if many of you have heard of Dr. Maurice Bukali. He uh, converted to Islam in the 1970s, and he wrote a famous book, The Quran and Science. Yeah, I don't think that's the exact title, but it's about the Quran and science. And he wrote this, of, you know, of course, as a Muslim. He said, I must confess that when the Quran was first being conveyed to people, the ancient Egyptian language had vanished from the collective memory of humanity for over two centuries and remained that way until the 19th century. So he's saying nobody really understood. We didn't have the Rosetta Stone, right? So people had forgotten hieroglyphics from more than 200 years before the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so around 300 and 400 A CE. And it remained that way until the 19th century. Therefore, it was impossible for us to know that the king of Egypt should be called anything other than the title mentioned in the Holy Bible. The subtle word choice of the Quran on this matter is thought-provoking. But for the Muslim, this is obvious. This is the arjaz of the Quran. This is the miracle of the Quran, that if it came min ghayri Allah, la wajadu fihi ikhtilafan kathira. That if it came from a source other than Allah, you would find a lot of contradictions. There would be inconsistencies, because any human book will have errors. That is inevitable. No matter how many editors you have on the project, there will be some mistakes. So the king, he responds, he loves this interpretation and he felt in his heart that it must be true. And he realized the virtue of Prophet Yusuf, his knowledge and dream. He valued his good conduct with his subjects. And it also, the way the Quran talks about the king seems to be very complimentary. It seems like he's looking for the truth. He recognizes the innocence of Yusuf and his value. So he says, ituni bi, right? Because who's conveying this whole, so far? Where's Yusuf? He's still in prison. This conversation is not happening in the king's throne because he's still there. It's been conveyed. Immediately he says, ituni bi, bring him to me. Release him from prison. When the emissary comes to Yusuf and conveys the news, what if somebody comes to the new and says, the, the king says that you should come with us, you should come out of prison? What would you say? You say, let's go, right? But Yusuf السلام, he refuses to leave the prison until the king and his subjects declare his complete innocence. He wanted them to know that sending him going into prison was an act of injustice, and he had not actually committed an offense. He says, irji' ila rabbik, that return back to your lord, the king, and in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, and in the two Sahihs, what are the two Sahihs? Who are Shaykhan? Bukhari and Muslim. The two Sahihs recorded that Abu Hurairah said that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and this is the third part of the whole hadith, وَلَوْ لَبِثْتُ فِي السِّجْنِ مَا لَبِثَ يُوسُفْ لَأَجَبْتُ الدَّاعِي And this is a very widely misinterpreted hadith, okay? The Prophet ﷺ said that if I were to be in his shoes, if I were to stay in prison for such a long time as Yusuf, I would have definitely taken the offer. I would say, let's go, right? So the Prophet ﷺ is saying, oh, Yusuf is more patient than me because if I was offered to leave, I would go, right? And what the Prophet ﷺ in another hadith, also from Abu Hurairah, 
he said about the Prophet's uh, Yusuf statement that فَاسْأَلْهُمَا بَالُ النِّسْوَى right? Ask the women of the city that لَوْ كُنْتُ أَنَا لَأَسْرَعْتُ الْإِجَابَةَ وَمَا وَمَا بْتَغَيْتُ الْعُذْرُ That if it had been me, I would have accepted the offer and I wouldn't wait for my exoneration first. I would get out and then I would clear my innocence. But Yusuf, he wanted to clear his innocence and then leave. So Allah said, that the king asked, قَالَ مَا خَطَبُ كُنَّ إِذْ رَاوَتُنَّ يُوسُفُ عَنْ نَفْسِي That what was your affair when you did seek to seduce Yusuf? Now the king, he gathers every single woman that was in that gathering, those that cut their hands, while they were being hosted in the house of Al-Aziz. And he asked them. Now, when, the, when Yusuf, well, we'll talk about that in a moment. Why, why is all the focus on the women? I mean, is that why he's in prison? It's like a sideshow. That's not the real reason. But he, the king, he understood. He's very perceptive. So he's kind of directing his speech as the wife of Al-Aziz. But he asks and he directs his inquiry at all of the women. He asks them, Ma khatubukunna? What is it about all of you? What was your affair? What transpired? What's the story? Idhrawatunna Yusuf an nafsi. When you did seek to seduce Yusuf on the day of the banquet. But who's the one that really tried to seduce Yusuf? That was Zulaikha. It was, I mean, the women, yes, they were, they, they, they had a little bit of a proposal that, oh, you know, spend a little bit more time with us. But it was really her. Mm -hmm. That, that's right, because by, 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 by putting them all collectively, then the spotlight is not on any individual person. It's a collective accusation. And then once they dig into it, then the truth would emerge. They would say, no, 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 he's a good guy. And then she would be in a position in which maybe the truth would come out. So what? that's exactly what happened. <laughs> they said, God forbid. We don't know anything evil about him. And the women answered the king that he couldn't be evil of this because we never knew him to do evil. And isn't it interesting that immediately she قالت امرأة العزيز الآن حصحص الحق The wife of Al-Aziz said now the truth has come out. right? It has been exposed. حصحص It has become manifest to us. Which means to become clear and to become Plain. And she adds on top of that, she could have said, yeah, yeah, he's telling the truth. But she says it very explicitly. She says, Ana ra wattuhu. She takes, she owns her actions. She takes accountability. That it was me. I sought to seduce him. An nafsihi wa innahu lamina sadiqeen. And also, he is of the truthful. Right? And truthful when he said what? That he ra wadatni an nafsi. Remember in the previous scene, that he had said that she's the one that sought to seduce me. Then the next ayah, anni lam akhunhu bil ghayb. So many tafsirs have been written about this. That who is the speaker? Who is saying this? In order that he may know that I betrayed him not in his absence. Is Zulaikha the one saying it? Or is Yusuf the one that's saying it? Or is she saying it and quoting him? There's too many possibilities. So one tafsir is that I admit this against myself so that my husband knows that I did nothing happen. That I didn't betray Lam Akhunhu Bil Ghaib, that I did not betray him in his absence, meaning that zina did not actually occur. This is one possibility. I tried to seduce this young man and he refused. And I am admitting this so that he knows that I am innocent. وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِي كَيْدَ الْخَائِنِينَ وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي And verily Allah guides not the plot of the betrayers and I free not myself from the blame. So she says, I don't exonerate myself because the soul wishes and lusts and this is what made me seduce him. النَّفْسِ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِالسُّوءِ That the nafs, as we talked about in the month of Ramadan, about the different phases of the nafs. النَّفْسِ الْأَمَّارَةٌ so we'll leave that for another sign. But this is the lowest form of the nafs, which is commanding also to evil. 
Inna Rabbi Ghafoorur Rahim. Surely my Lord is oft forgiving, most merciful. Now, according to Ibn Kathir, he says this is the most natural reading. That who's the speaker? Zulaikha. He says this follows the grammatical sequence. It makes the most sense. Imam al Mawardi, he wrote the same thing. And Ibn Taymiyyah, he also took the same position. But it's also said that Yusuf is the one that says, anni lam akhunhu bil ghayb. It could be that she is quoting Yusuf. So even though she's saying it, that she is that he is Mina Sadiqeen, he is the truthful, meaning he was truthful when he said. Right? So meaning she's quoting him. In order that Al Aziz may know that I did not betray him with his wife. So it takes on a different meaning. If Yusuf is the one saying that until the end of the ayah, and he said, I sent back the emissary so the king would investigate it. Anni lam akhunhu. So that means that Yusuf, he knew that after the investigation, it would become manifest that he never betrayed the trust of Al-Aziz. And that Allah does not guide the plot of the betrayers. This is what Imam al-Tabari, this is what he preferred. But I think I agree more with Ibn Kathir in the first view. It makes more sense that the person who is present is the one who is speaking. Because Yusuf is still in prison, so it must be the wife. It has to be a continuation of the person who is present in the conversation, not the person who is not there. Now, if we adopt that interpretation, right? And by the way, this shows from Yusuf that you should defend yourself, but you should also admit that you have the capacity for wrongdoing. But this interpretation that I just presented puts Zulaikha in a very positive light. This makes a big difference. Because if it's Yusuf, then Yusuf is saying that, well, I never, it's, it's kind of repetitive because he's already said that I wouldn't do that to, to my master. But if it's Zulaikha, it takes on a whole different meaning. It shows that perhaps Iman has entered into her heart and she recognizes the mistake. So to me, the meaning is more correct and makes more sense. Now there's another thing that we started to talk about, which is the sensitivity of Yusuf. He says, go to the women that cut their hand. He doesn't even mention the name of Imra'atul Aziz. He doesn't even say what happened about the wife of Al-Aziz, and she's the reason that he's in prison. Imam Al-Qurtubi, he said this was in consideration for the right of his master's house, because he was brought up there, and that he had the decency not to cast aspersions against them. And this is the opposite of cancel culture, right? Somebody makes a mistake, throw them under the bus, right? So Yusuf, he did not want to expose, he was concerned with his own innocence, but he was not interested in throwing them under the bus. So because of that, he said, ask the women, instead of pointing the finger directly. And if proof was needed, then he could do it in a way that no one was disgraced. It was the most delicate way. And there's an important note here about the praise of the prophets, right? Um, obviously, he's praising Yusuf, but it also suggests that he wouldn't have done that. Does it mean that Yusuf is better than the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? But didn't the Prophet sallallahu say that I wouldn't have the patience? I would, I would get out first. It sounds like the because the Prophet is praising Yusuf, right? But at the same time, isn't it beautiful how the Messenger وسلم, is saying that Yusuf is going over the top? That he didn't need to do that. He did it because of his beautiful akhlaq, because of his beautiful character. But in fact, the Prophet وسلم, is an example for us. And he's showing us that we should be practical. We should be pragmatic. That it's more appropriate in teaching the ummah that we should go with the best course of action. And that in that situation, don't trust politicians. Don't trust political rulers. Because the temperament of the kings, one day you're on top of the world, the next day you can lose favor, right? Look at the election in Pakistan, right? The army loved him, and then he can do no wrong. The army doesn't want him, now they, make, they put him in prison, they forget the key. Speaking of people in prison, right? Imran Khan, he goes from being the hero down to zero. Because... You never know with these people with power, 
in the elites that one minute you're in their favor and the next minute forget about it. So you cannot place trust in that. So this shows that the Prophet ﷺ is showing the believer to be cautious and to have that perception. So for the regular person, putting conditions on your release makes no sense. You know, so there might be opportunities, for example, for Muslims to go on TV shows to talk about what's happening in Gaza. And you might say, no, 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 you, your reporting is unfair. Boycott, boycott, right? But sometimes you just have, you have a chance. You have, you have an opportunity to say what you want to say. So instead of canceling it, avail yourself of the opportunities that you have. You have to take what you get. Okay, this takes us to the last part which is Yusuf alayhi salam being honored. He says, Place me in charge of the storehouses, the khaza'in, which originally means treasures, but here it means the storehouses. He saw that he has the attention of the king and he took advantage, he struck while the iron is hot. He took advantage of that and he makes a request to the king so that he would be empowered he would be in a position to make positive change. That is not immodest. That is not a mistake. If you're in a position and somebody says, oh, we want you to run for public office. We want to nominate you on the committee. You're in your company. They say, oh, we're making a group, a committee. Would you like to be on it? That if you have a chance to do something good, then you should do it. Like the Prophet ﷺ said, about Hilf al fudud He said, وَلَوْ دُعِيتُ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ لَأَجَبْتْ That if I was called to it as a Muslim, I would definitely answer that call because it's a good group. So he was able to take all the granaries and take all the surplus corn and store it in seven years. Imam Malik, he mentions how I have met 70 men in Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi and they narrate hadith from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Imam Malik, he said, I have not accepted a single hadith from them. Can you imagine that? They are barely a hundred and change years from the Prophet ﷺ. Known people in al Madina, and he says, I don't accept them. Why is that? He says, although any of them, if they were appointed to the state treasury, they would be found trustworthy people. But I do not believe them as having mastered the discipline. He said, I don't trust their accuracy. I don't, tr it's not that I'm, Imam Malik is not saying that I think that they're liars. He said, these people are not precise. I can't take hadith from them. I only take from the person that has thiqa and that has dabt. And these people don't have dabt. So I'm not taking from them. That doesn't, he's not accusing them of something bad. But People are good at different things. In Arabic, they have a saying, "Aati khubzak lil khabbaz," right? That if you want good bread, where do you go? You go to the bakery. Don't go to Imam Saab. Can you make us some bread? I mean, I can try. It's going to be all lumpy and weird, you know. <laughs> right? You know, I mean, I, inshallah, I'll be able to do it, but it's not going to be that good compared to if you go to a nice artisanal bakery. You know, they'll make you some sourdough bread. You know, you can just eat it with your eyes, right? Because that person knows what they're doing. So then the religion of the same king prevailed in Egypt for 10 years. And this also shows that accepting a post under, we can, uh, if people are interested, we can talk about it in the questions, that can you take a post under a non-Muslim government? A lot of commentary has been around this. That can you, you know, people, they say, oh, this is a kafir country. So we can't be part of it. They don't say that when the IRS tax season rolls around. April 15, they're not like, this is a kafir country. They pay their taxes. They get a parking ticket. They're not like, this is a kafir country. But when it comes to having a voice about doing things, they're like, no, 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 this is a non-Muslim system. Haram, right? So isn't it interesting how people twist things to support their laziness, right? So you have to be engaged, and this is a very strong proof. And Yusuf, he even says, he says that inni hafidun alim. He mentions two things. He says, I'm efficient and I'm protective. I'm trustworthy and I know what I'm doing. And so he was appointed as the minister of finance. And in fact, it's reported that the, according to Mujahid, 
that the king embraced Islam at the hand of Yusuf alayhi salam. He became his most trusted advisor. And in fact, he basically was running the government during the retirement of that king. Now, one footnote here. Some of the commentators have written that when Qitfir, the husband of Zulaikha, died during this period. So the scene that we just described, Qitfir has already passed away. Everybody with me? This is according to the biblical. So the, during the seven years while Yusuf is in prison, what happens? Qitfir dies. Right? This is not, these are from non-Muslim sources. Right? And the king of Egypt arranges her marriage to Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam. So he plays matchmaker. And then he says to her, he says, is this not much better than that which you had wished for? See, that Allah's plan is much better than the plan that you were, because remember she was, inna kayda kunna azim. Remember she had a plot, but Allah's plan is much superior. And Zulaikha, she confessed to being at fault and gave an excuse for that. Then Allah Azza wa Jal granted them a life full of honor and comfort. According to the historical narratives, they were blessed with two sons, Ephraim and Mansha. And, you know, there's one curious thing. Um, people have asked, they said, why did Yusuf fall into love with Zulaikha so many years after? Because remember, she was in love with him. Right? Wouldn't it make sense there's an attractive woman that's pursuing you and you would fall in love at that moment, right? But Yusuf, he didn't fall in love then. Only years later, seven, eight, nine, ten years later, then he falls in love with her. This is a sign of Iman. When the halal and the permissible is beautiful for you, when that's attractive to you, and the haram looks disgusting. It looks petty. It looks insignificant. It looks vulgar, right? So a lot of Muslims, they struggle with like pornography addiction. Part of it is not just the addiction. Part of it is that that looks attractive to you instead of something ugly and something that is offensive. So the, the believer fi finds the halal avenues, the healthy avenues, and that is what is attractive to them. And then according to some of the narrations, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after that marriage, put more love in the heart of Yusuf for Zulaikha than even she ever had for him. And so much so, there was a time that Yusuf alayhi salam complained to her, why is it that you don't love me as much as before? Right? This is the classical problem. You know, I think maybe... You know, people like the chase, right? <laughs> like to be pursued. So then Zulaikha told him that through you, I am now blessed with the love of Allah. I have the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with this in view, all other relationships and thoughts have dimmed out. And this showed that her love for Yusuf alayhi salam, it continued, but there was a much greater love that she had for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the love for him was a part of that not something that was separate from that there's more detail of this in Tafsir al-Qurtubi if anyone is interested okay so uh, this concludes our session about Yusuf alayhi salam getting out and going from being the lowest in the society I think there's a microphone here inshallah um, being the lowest in society, being in prison, and then going shooting straight up to being at the top of the world and being right with the king. Yeah. I think Kashif has a question. Uh, thank you. This was a beautiful um, session. Um, throughout the surah, there seems to be many dreams. Um, some of them seem to be predictive meaning this is what's going to happen. There is no ability to change the future. Mm. And this one seems to be prescriptive, mm. which is this is what you should do to change the outcome. How, mm. how, do, how, does, how, do we, how do we integrate that into our own lives as it pertains to dreams and, and the notion of free will? 
Sure, I, I think it's both. I think it's both descriptive and proscriptive and, uh, and prescriptive. Because the original dream is seeing the Ra'aytu Ahad Ashara Kalkaba. He sees the 11 planets and the sun and the moon prostrating to him. So it is telling him how the story ends, but it also is there to give him encouragement that don't always stay positive, always stay optimistic because Al Aqibatu Lil Muttaqeen. Because the, the end and the victory always belongs to the righteous people. Similarly, the dream of the king, it's both. Because one hand, it's, it's well, it's not really descriptive, but it, 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 it is a precursor of what's going, it's a prediction of what's going to happen. But it also, if you know what's going to happen, it's kind of like the, all those movies about, anybody see Back to the Future? So you got to have seen Back to the Future, I mean. One of the most important movies, right? So the problem with, I'm dating myself, right? <laughs> so the problem with going, I mean, this is like every movie with a time machine. What happens when you go in the future, right? Or go, go to the past? What, what happens if you start doing things? Exactly, you mess up the whole continuum, right? So you mess up the trajectory of what's going to happen. But on the other hand, if you know what's going to happen, you can affect the future in a positive way. So I believe that it does apply to us today, that there are people that will get a dream. So let's say there are people who have dreamt of their own death coming before they die, within a short period. If you had a dream that you're going to die the next week, is that go dream going to affect your behavior? A hundred percent. I mean, is there anyone that's not going to be affected by that dream? Of course. We're going we're gonna to totally organize our affairs. We're going to make sure that we don't have any regrets. We're going to ask everybody to forgive us, so on and so forth. Because we know that that's what's going to happen. So that knowledge can actually be very beneficial for us. Or let's say you're starting a business and you have a dream that you know it's successful and everything goes great. Another one, a lot of people pray istikhara and they see a dream of their marriage or being together and having a family and having children. However, the dream comes out. If you see that in a dream, wouldn't it affect your decision making? It would. So there are different types of dreams. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us dreams not to tell us about future events, but to give us encouragement. Other times it's as a warning. It's to kind of keep us to steer away from things. Then in other cases you get a dream in which we're supposed to adjust our behavior. This dream is very much that third category where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving the king this information so they can change their course. So in fact it's, it's, it's both types. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Jazakallah khair. Um, I mean, definitely being in the prison and the other guy to forget, it's all a plan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the king to see the dream. So all of that, I think, in sequence, what Allah intended ultimately. But I want to touch on the point where um, when the malik asks um, the niswa as a plural, uh, whether they come as, as if all of them did use Yusuf or not. I mean, to me, I think it started with Yusuf because he started with the, all the women together. And why he put them together, um, in addition to the reasoning which you put by previous scholars, um, it might be another way to look at it because if he said about uh, Zulaikha herself, there is a possibility she might deny. I mean, they might go investigate her mm -hmm. and she could deny. So I think it might be, and you are a trial lawyer, of course. <laughs> so it might be a good idea to have the witness as well. Yes, that's right. They so, can corroborate. Right. So, yeah. and, and that might also reduce the possibility that she could deny. Because if she deny now, there are other witnesses. Mm. So 
I do not know if that makes sense, but I think it's it's a factor there um, in support of Yusuf. So there are other witnesses as well. Thank you. Mashallah. I, I think this is this is brilliant. I think this is um, it's also he's getting character witnesses from the people that made accusations against him. And then also it's like when Abu Sufyan is in front of Hiraqal and he's asked about the Prophet and he said, well, I wanted to say something bad about him, but why didn't he? He said, if I said something bad about the Prophet then people would call me a liar. So he said, because of that, I said the truth. And he said, glowing praise for the Prophet So I, I love this point about how uh, Yusuf, from the very beginning, he sets it up in such a way that they have to corroborate each other's testimony. And one person can't go outside of that because then everybody else will be like, no, 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 he's a good guy. And then that one person will lose all credibility. So it was kind of a very safe move um, um, as well. There's a question here. Salam, Imam, wa salam. I'm glad you brought up the turmoil happening in Pakistan. It wasn't really my intention, but I'm following the news, so what else? Uh, can you please indulge, right, I have uh, Pakistani in-laws, so I need to know what's going on when we have dinner. Um, indulge in expanding on that point since we can draw lessons from that current event. You know, I don't know if everybody's going to like my insight or not, but I think what's happening in Pakistan shows us the danger of army running things, right, you know, and... And, 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 and people were okay with this military rule for so long, as long as it was benefiting their interests. But as soon as the army turns around and goes against the public and the population, then suddenly we have a problem. We're like, no, 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 we don't want army rule. And this goes back many, many generations and, and many decades, but it's coming home to kind of affect people on the street. Um, but the problem is power becomes very entrenched and it's very hard to remove. You know, in the Arab world, we're very used to this, right? So we just call it al-hukm al-askari, right? The military rules, everybody's like, yeah, al-hukm al-askari, what can we do, right? But in some countries, they pretend to be democratic. So that's, that's a problem because then people are like, what? We, we're not actually free? So the, people also ask Islamically in terms of, uh, you know, what is the political government that we should come to expect? The, the government that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes is that which is representative. There is no single model. We had four different caliphs, khalifas, and each one was elected in a different way. So the religion does not prescribe a specific model. So when people ask the question, oh, is Islam and democracy compatible? That question doesn't make sense because Islam does not have a specific way. We have this idea like, oh, the Khalifa is appointed and then he chooses the next Khalifa. Only once in Islamic history, in the case of Umar, did Abu Bakr say the Caliph is Umar. It was the only time in which he was appointed. All the other cases were done through, through Shura. Assalamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as Brother Muhammad has mentioned that, the, you know, the, um, I don't use word of story because story could be fabricated. Mm. These are the events. These are the accounts. And the Quran goes step by step on those accounts. These are the accounts, event kind mm. of a things. That's reality that's happening. Mm. Story mm. is fabricated. Story could be anybody can come up with the illusion kind of thing. This is not an illusion. These are the that's accounts right. step by step. So the thing is that this whole event of uh, Prophet Yusuf leaving the, the prison, all this kind of stuff, two things what he did, which we should learn that. Man. Mm -hmm. He established the justice. Yes. That's one thing which is people usually ignore that. You know, he said, look, I don't need any favor. I need a justice. And he wanted to establish the justice to see truth should come out. And justice mm -hmm. that's what the problem is in our country Ju there's no justice there and he does that in distributing the, exactly. the grain right we're going to talk about the next right. week inshallah the justice. second aspect of that yeah. is that if you look at more deeply he saved the humanity yes because had he, he he actually gave a proposal 
how to do things to save the humanity. Otherwise, you can imagine what will happen in the in the famine. And the, a lot of people could have been died mm -hmm. because his proposal was the one to save the humanity. This is actually uh, Imam Malik said the same thing that you said. He said that Egypt is the storehouse of the world. And uh, actually the proof of this is the fact that Yusuf's family is not in Egypt. Right. And there was famine around the world and they all came to Egypt. That's how they ended up there, right? Because they were seeking food in order to survive. Yeah, his, his proposal was that to, to make sure if you, if you look at the why he was proposing to the king mm. about that, I mean, he did not, he looked at the problem, okay? Here is a dream. There's a problem, okay? Mm. And then he came up with the with the solution of that problem. Right, right, right. And that saved the human, humanity is the kind of things. So the two things, if you look at the the action or mm. the you know practical solution of that, it was it was uh, And that's exactly like the ayah. In me Hafidun Alim. He described that I am a Hafid, that I'm uh, I, I protect and preserve yeah. everything and he's responsible. And Ali, and he's knowledgeable, which connects to the two points that you made. Right. No. So, so the, come to the point, then you know he proposed <laughs> his own position. Mm. In the, <laughs> I mean, that is, yeah. you know, that also teaches you. You don't need to be shy away. Yeah. If you are capable of doing something, you need to let people know yeah. that these are my, you know, expertise, or I can do those things. I'll, you know, he was blessed with Allah. You know, interpretation of the dream is not kind of, uh, you can, there are, in, back home, there are so many people, they are doing your interpretation of the dream, which is absolutely wrong. But he was given a knowledge by God, by Allah. Yeah. He has a special, you know, knowledge mm -hmm. right. uh, by God. So I think mm -hmm. that's what the, it's it's true. but I don't know about the marriage of the, but Quran doesn't. No, these go. are very, these are very, very weak narrations. Right. Those are Quran doesn't go. But in I that like kind them. Of a thing. So why not? <laughs> it could be true. Right. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I mean, I told you from when we started this prophet series, I said we're going to use all these weak narrations. So these are not authentic. The whole thing that we said at the end about them getting married and having children, these are all non-Muslim sources that we're using. Right. They could be true. They might not be. Yeah, the important yeah. thing is that he yeah. established the justice in a way, even, even the, during the famine, yeah. during the things that he wanted to distribute, uh, you know, the grains or, or the right. food, whatever, more equitably, you know, make sure everybody is survived yeah. that mm -hmm. way. That's a justice. It's not that I'm going to take all my grain to my yeah. family, I'm going to take all those things to my right. favorite right. kind of a things, but that was the justice as well. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. okay, anyone else before we close the session? Yeah. Oh, got a couple here. I'm just uh, curious. Uh, what was the age gap between Yusuf, Ali Islam, and uh, and uh, Zulaikha? <coughs> it's not as big as you might think because uh -huh. he because uh, fear is much much older than his uh -huh. wife. Oh, but she's okay. older than Yusuf, for okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But it's not as much as you might think. Okay. Yeah, right. Thanks. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to mention something about patience, because uh, from what you mentioned, it sounded like the patience of Sayyidina Yusuf, alayhi salam. Uh, and that made me think about what uh, Sayyidina Yaqub had to go through. Hmm. So if you count the nine years in prison, hmm. and uh, his brother is coming only in the drought years, so that's seven plus. Plus the years he spent uh, in the Aziz growing up, so that's more than 20 years mm. that he spent away from Sayyidina Yaqub. Mm. And so the man who couldn't bear to be separated from his son for one day got to spend more than 20 years not knowing where he is, mm. or maybe not even knowing if he was alive or not. Mm. So 20 years of sadness, and yet he did not lose hope. And Mila Ali to Reha Yusuf. When it came back mm. to him, so that's I think uh, another great lesson mm. from Allah. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Um, salam, Imam. I struggle with the story of the marriage greatly. It's like rewarding the bad behavior, Zulaikha, albeit she repented. I love this question. I wanted this question. You know, I think this is such an important question 
because we, when we hear a story, we're used to Hollywood. So there's the good guy and there's the bad guy of the story, right? This is what we're used to. So we automatically decide, we put people into buckets. The, the idea that Zulaikha is the one, the tafsir that I prefer is that she's the one that uh, makes the statement, right? About an nafs, which shows that she became a Muslim. So whether they get married or not is not that important to me. But the reformation of Zulaikha, I, 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 I believe in that. That she became a Muslim and that she admitted her mistake. For me, that's the important part. Whether they got married or not, that's another thing. And it's important for us to know that she is not evil, right? She made a mistake and she is a human being with feelings. And none of us are safe from that nafs. Because in the nafs la amaratun bisu, we are all capable of doing something wrong and haram. She made a mistake, she realized it, and she repented. So there is an important component within this surah, which is that people that make very serious mistakes can change. And that people are not locked into that same trajectory. And, and the story of the marriage only confirms that the idea that a prophet, you think a prophet, so he has to marry somebody who's like pure and innocent and never made a mistake. No, but we're human beings. So there's nothing wrong in Zulaikha marrying Yusuf alayhi salam. So we kind of have to rewire our brains in order to understand that, okay, that's not a bad thing, right? So alhamdulillah, may Allah increase us in knowledge and connection to the Qur'an. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'na, wanfa'na bima allamtana, wazidna ilma, wazidna ilman yuqarribuna ilayk. Allahumma ahfaz ummata Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma ansurhum. نصر عزيز مقتدر اللهم انصر إخواننا المستضعفين في كل مكان سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين